Let's close our eyes for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible study we have tonight. Thank you because you are leading us as we look at your word and as we study. We bless your name for the revelation you have given us through the Lord Jesus Christ and through that angel and through John the Beloved. We are praying, O oh Lord, you help us to understand this revelation even to here tonight in Jesus' name. We are praying for everyone gathered in this location and every other location where we are studying together. And we are praying, Lord, you open our eyes to behold great wondrous things out of your word in Jesus' name. Bless your people tonight as we study together. Open eyes of understanding that we may understand what you want us to understand. And we pray that these things will not be studied in vain, but will make real, definite mark in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. I welcome every one of you to our Bible study tonight. Tonight, we're in the last chapter of the book of Revelation. We're looking at Revelation chapter 22. And we're looking at verses 1 through to 9. Tonight, the topic is the privilege and inheritance of the righteous. When you are a righteous person, when you come to know the Lord, you have some privileges here on earth. But then in eternity, you also have some privileges. And there's an inheritance for the righteous here on earth. And there are inheritances or heritage for the children of God there in heaven when we get to heaven. Tonight, we're looking at the inheritance and the privilege we have as righteous people up there in heaven reserved for us. Please open your Bible with me as we look at Revelation chapter 22 from verse 1. And it showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, and in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These things are, the fit, are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophet sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sins of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down at I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not. For I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sins of this book, worship God. As we look at the book of Revelation, and we look at the things that we have learned, you remember, if you've been with us for some time, that we have learned of the great prophecies that will affect both the church and the world. Actually, the book of Revelation begins with the vision of the glorified Christ. You come to chapter 1, and you see the vision of the glorified Christ. You know that John the Beloved had seen Jesus Christ in the days of his flesh. In the days of his humiliation, in the days of his suffering, when he was getting ready to provide sacrifice for the salvation of the world. And then Jesus died and was buried. And then he rose the third day. And when Jesus rose from the dead, John the beloved saw the risen Christ. And then eventually after 40 days of infallible proof and appearing to his own disciples, he was taken up to heaven. And since that time, John the Beloved had not seen the Lord. But all of a sudden, in chapter 1 of Revelation, there was a voice behind him. And as he looked back, he saw the glorified Christ. And what a sight he saw. 
And then after he had seen that, then comes the message to the church. Which means that he is Christ. Giving the message to the church with counsel and encouragement to every member in the church age. That will possess an overcoming faith to live the overcoming life. Because then we have the promises of God and the promises of Christ. Reign forever and ever with the Lord. As the book of Revelation unfolds, there are seven things we have seen in a very broad way. Number one is the rapture of the church. Number two is a great tribulation. Number three is the battle of Armageddon. And then number four, the imprisonment of Satan. Number five, Christ's second coming and his millennial reign. Number six, the great white throne judgment. And then number seven, the new heaven and the new earth. As you look at the book of Revelation, after you have seen the glorified Christ in chapter 1. And then in chapters 2 and 3, the message to the church in the church age. Then you now come to the rapture of the church. That rapture of the church I've been spoken about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, reading from verse 13. Here Paul the apostle revealing the rapture of the church. What will happen at the end of the church age? It tells us, But I would not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this will say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, proceed, hinder them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be cut up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. That's what will happen at the end of the church age. The rapture of the church. The, the saints of God will rise from the dead. And then those of us who are alive will be caught up together with them. And will be with the Lord. Immediately after that will be the great tribulation. And that great tribulation is described in Revelation chapter 6 all through to 19. I want you to notice something in chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, we're looking at the last verse there. And you will see it will be a time of great suffering for the people left behind in the world at that time. Revelation chapter 6 verse 17. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? The great day of the wrath of God. That's describing the great tribulation. And all through chapters uh, 6 and 8 and all through to chapter 19, you have that great day of the wrath of God, of the fierce anger of the Lord upon the disobedient and rebellious all over the world. And then as we come to chapter 19, reading there in verse 15, chapter 19, verse 15, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with each him he shall smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of the Almighty God. What did we meet in chapter 6? The wrath of God. And what are we reading about in chapter 19? The wrath of God. In between chapter 6 and chapter 19, what are we reading about? The wrath of God. That is the great tribulation. After that great tribulation, that is at the end of that great tribulation, will be the battle of Armageddon. And you have that described for you at the end of chapter 19. We're reading now from verse 17 of chapter 19. It says, I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that she may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and the flesh of them that siege on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. That's the battle of Armageddon described right there. When the Lord Jesus Christ will come as a warrior and then he will destroy all those people that do not know the Lord, that rebel against the word of the Lord and that reject the salvation of the Lord. And they have come to the very end rejecting that salvation. And then you have the imprisonment of Satan in chapter 20 of Revelation from verse 1. 
And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set his seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years shall be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. There we have the description of the imprisonment of the devil, of Satan, that dragon. Then after that, you have now number five, that is the second coming of Christ and his millennial reign. That same chapter 20 reading from verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them which that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, or in their, or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Number one I told you is the rapture of the church. Number two is the great tribulation following after that rapture of the church, which will take place for about seven years. And then number three, the battle of Armageddon at the end of the great tribulation. And then number four will be the imprisonment of Satan. Immediately after that, you have Christ's second coming and his millennial reign. And all the sinners that still remain on earth, as well as the ones that have died, from the, uh, from the first sinner to the very last sinner, will be called before the great white throne judgment. That's why you read from chapter 20 verse 11. And I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they judged every man according, and, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found reaching in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Then after that now we have the new heaven and the new earth. Revelation chapter 21 verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And we have already gone through that chapter 21. We have seen the designation of that new Jerusalem. We have seen the description of that new Jerusalem. And we have seen the dimensions of that new Jerusalem. We also saw the delight of the citizens of that city. That is of the people of God. Because that new Jerusalem will be the heavenly city. The eternal abode of the righteous. That beautiful city will be the eternal home of all the people that have been saved and made holy by their faith in God. From the days of Abel to the last martyr slain by the Antichrist. And the holy city is the home of the blessed and the holy of all time. Our present study then in chapter 22 is continuing the description of that amazing city of light and beauty and wonder. As we come to this study today, we're going to divide the study into three parts. Number one, the restoration of the river of life. The restoration of the river of life. Number two, the return and the reign of the Lord. The return and the reign of the Lord. And then number three now is the reaction and the rebuke of love. The reaction and the rebuke of love. Let's come back to number one. The restoration of the river of life. You see, as you open chapter 22, and you read from verse 1, 
you have the river of life. And if you go back to Genesis chapter 3 or chapter 2, you're going to find that same river of life. Why do we then say there's a restoration? Because what was in Eden is now in this paradise revealed, or paradise restored, or paradise regained. It's telling us that the river of life that Adam and Eve lost, that they missed at that time, is now restored, renewed, regained, revealed unto us. Let's read Revelation chapter 22. I'm, to, I'm reading it from verse 1. And it showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, that river of life, was there the tree of life, and which bare twelve fruits, twelve manner of fruits, and yielded a fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And the servant, his servant shall serve him. And they shall see his face. And his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light. And... They shall reign forever and ever. In that passage we have read together, you'll see two things there. Number one is the water of life, the river of the water of life. You find that in verse 1. And then you also find the tree of life in verse 2. And John the beloved said, he showed me a pure river of the water of life. It's clear as crystal. And it's proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. You remember that in that first paradise, Eden, there was a beautiful river with four branches. And that water, the garden of Eden, now heaven, the heavenly paradise, which is the paradise regained or restored or revealed unto us now, will be glorified with the beautiful, life-refreshing river. As you look at uh, Psalm 46, Psalm 46, reading from verse 4. It tells us about the city of God and tells us about the river there as well. It tells us, Psalm 46 verse 4, There is a river, the streams whereof make, shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. So then you understand that the river of life had been revealed to the people of old. That when we get to heaven, that's what we'll see and we'll drink out of that water of life. In uh, Psalm 65 verse 9. 65 verse 9. Thou visitest the earth and waterest it. Thou greatly enrichest it with the river of God, which is full of water that preparest them corn. When thou hast provided for it, it talks about the river of God and it's full of water. And what a refreshing experience that will be for those who make it to heaven on that final day. I pray you'll make it. In Psalm 36, verse 8, they shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thine house, and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. So it's a kind of river that will give pleasure, that will give happiness, that will give joy to the people of God on that day. As we look at this, we also read about the tree of life. Let's come back to Revelation chapter 22. We have not only read of the water of life there, we have also read of the tree of life. It says in verse 3, in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Let's turn back to Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, reading from verse 22, and see what Adam and Eve missed, what they lost when they sinned against the Lord. And that's what the Lord is telling us we're going to gain when it comes to that time. Paradise regained or paradise revealed or paradise restored. Genesis chapter 3, reading from verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. 
And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and live forever. Lest he put forth his hand and take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove, the, he drove out the man, and he placed at the east end, at the east of the garden of Eden, cherubims, and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. You see what Adam lost? You see what Eve lost? They lost the privilege of eating of that tree of life. If they had eaten of the tree of life, what would have happened to them? They would have lived forever. And the Lord did not want them to live forever in that condition of sinfulness, in that condition of pollution, in that condition of depravity. And so he drove them out. By the time we get to heaven, you remember, we're already saved. We're already sanctified. We're already made holy. We're already pure in heart. And the Lord wants us to live forever in that state of holiness, that state of purity, and that state of sanctity or sanctification, that state of pleasing the Lord. He wants us to live forever. That's why you have the tree of life. Please come back to Revelation chapter 22. We need to explain something there. Reading from verse 2 again. In the midst of the street of each, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life. What's the tree of life for? Is it to heal our sicknesses? No, not at all. There will be no sickness there. Is it to remove any cause? No, not at all. There will be no cause there. Is it to relieve us of our pain? No, not at all. There will be no pain. By the time we get to heaven, already we're wearing resurrected body, risen body, glorified body, and there's no sickness, and there's no pain, and there's no cause, and there's no pressure, and there's nothing evil at all because all that had been taken away. So when he talks about the fruit, the, the fruit of the tree of life, that is for the healing of the nations. That word means the health of the nations. That is, the people who are alive in the Lord. The people who have risen from the dead. No pain, no sorrow, no tears, nothing like sickness, and no Satan, no demon, and no corruption, no evil at all. They will be kept healthy forever and ever. Revelation chapter 21 verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. And so let nobody think that there is any sickness in heaven, that's why you have the tree of life there. No, not at all. It's talking about keeping you healthy and keeping you sound for the health of the nations. And then it tells us, he that sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he says unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give unto him that success of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So then we understand it's not for the healing of sickness. Let's come back again to Revelation chapter 22. Reading from verse 2. And in the midst of the street of each and of either side of the river was there the tree of life which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now you understand there are some people that read their Bibles upside down. And then they misplace the verses of the Bible. There are some people that will tell you that they are doing uh, their medicine or their, their herbalists or whatever. And, and you see today there is much promotion about the herbs. And about uh, taking the leaves of the tree and putting them together. Either to make soap or even to make a uh, toothpaste. Or even to make uh, something they say will cure this and cure that. And then if you challenge them, or if somebody is introducing that to you, or they will say, of course, it's in the Bible. That, uh, you know, if you look at Revelation chapter 22, verse 2, you will see it right there. It is for the life and for the health of the nations. And in fact, they say that it will even make you live forever. That this one, you will not be sick at all. Let's understand, there is no tree on earth now that anybody can 
go and take the leaves of the fruits and say this is the tree of life because we know that the tree of life came up in the garden of eden and when adam and eve sinned, that tree of life was kept away from man and then nobody knows the site of the garden of eden now so there's nobody in any country in africa or asia or america or anywhere that will say that the trees there you seen are the trees of life there's nothing like that at all and then when he talks of the nations when it says it's for the healing of the nations we mustn't forget what we have studied before if you come back to revelation chapter 21 reading from verse 27 and there shall in no wise center into it anything that defileth neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie so the nations we are talking about in chapter 22 are the people in a, a holy generation a royal priesthood a holy nation that is the people who are born again the people who are children of god because the people that are sinful or abominable or they are defiling none of them shall enter there and when you get to heaven you have these people that are referred to now as the nation that is the nation of righteous people, the nation of saintly people, the nation of restored people, the nation of redeemed people, the nation of righteous people. And so we have them in heaven. And then we'll be taking of that tree of life and we'll be taking of that water of life as well. And then we're told in the word of God that that's what we're expecting now. In Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 21. Romans chapter 8, verse 21. Because the creature itself is also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. That's what we're waiting for. When we shall be delivered and when we shall see the Lord face to face and then we'll see the glory of Christ, the glory of the Lamb in Revelation ch in uh, John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Reading from verse 24. It says, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. Where is he? It's in heaven. Where is that? That's the holy city. That's the habitation of the people of God. That's the abode of the almighty God himself. And the Lord Jesus Christ is there right now. And he says, I want them to be with me where I am. That they also that they may behold my glory. Which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world but for us to be there we must be pure in heart for us to be there we must really know the lord because the lord jesus christ said in matthew chapter 5 verse 8 you have a desire to be in heaven this is the qualification that will get you there you want to take of that water of life this is what will qualify you for it and you want to eat of that tree of life this is what you ought to have matthew chapter 5 verse 8 blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The people that will be there on that day are the people that have been purified. They have been pardoned to start with. They have been purged from their sins. And they have been purified by the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. Those are the people, the pure in heart, that will see God and will be there in Jesus' name. In Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Follow peace with all men. Let me remind you, all men, not some men, not a few men, not the easygoing men, every kind of people. Uh, all the difficult ones and the easy ones, the easygoing people, follow peace with all men. And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. We follow peace with all men. And then we have holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. In that verse 2 it says, in the midst of each, and on either side of the river was there, the tree of life. In the future state of the blessed, of the blessed, the tree of life will abound, and all in the holy city may freely partake of it as a pledge of immortal life. Immortal life, that means an unending life. A life that never ends, a life that never dies, a life that never gets weak. A life that never gets sick. And when you partake of that tree, then you keep on living forever. The fruits of the tree of life will be for the nourishment of God's immortal saints. That is, never dying saints. In the heavenly city, there will be no pain. There will be no cause. There will be no tears. There will be no more death. And the water of life and the fruits of the tree of life will sustain our earthly lives. 
I'm going to ask you a question before we move on. Who are the people that will have chance to take of that water of life still in the future? The answer is, those who take of the water of life in the present time. Who are the people that will eat of the tree of life in the future? The answer is, those who take of the tree of life that's available now for the people of God. You say, is there such a thing as a water of life now? Is there such a thing as a tree of life now? Look at the word of God. Revelation chapter 22 verse, seven, verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. That's our salvation. Let him take the water of life freely. It's available today. And it's only those who drink of the water of life today that will be able to take the water of life over there in the future. Look at Revelation chapter 21, verse 6. Revelation 21, verse 6. He tells us, and he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. That means you are thirsty for salvation. More than you are thirsty for natural food. You are, you are thirsty for salvation. The water of life available and present today. More than you are thirsty or eager or desirous for any other thing on the earth today. In fact, the Bible calls this the fountain of life. And let's look at Psalm 36. In Psalm 36, there is the fountain of life. And you must visit that fountain. And it's in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is through that you can have the water of life today. It's only when you visit the Lord and then you have the fountain of life for the water of life today. That's when you can have that water of life in the future. Psalm 36, reading from verse 7. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thine house. And thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. For, thee, for with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. The fountain of life. You come to the Lord Jesus Christ. You're thirsty. You are desirous. You are passionate for something. And then you want that desire to be fulfilled. You want that passion to be fulfilled. You come to the Lord Jesus Christ and you have of the fountain of life. Number one is the water of life. Number two is the fountain of life. It tells us in Proverbs chapter 14 verse 27. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. While we're reading this, the people that have a fountain of life now, they're the people that will get to heaven eventually. And they're the people that will be able to partake of that water of life. And what is it to have a fountain of life today? To depart from the snares of death. And to run away from anything that will cause spiritual death in your life today. Number one, there's the water of life is present today. Number two, there is the fountain of life is available today. Number three, there's a covenant of life. Covenant of life. You come into the covenant of life with the Lord Jesus now, with the Almighty God now. And it is that covenant that will help you eventually to get to heaven. And then you'll be able to have that water of life. A, nobody can just say, well, I'm going to have the water of life. Do you have the covenant of life with the Lord? It is that covenant of life that will lead you eventually to that river of the water of life. In Malachi chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 5. Malachi chapter 2, reading from verse 5. This is talking about that covenant of life. And you need to make that covenant with the Lord. It says in Malachi chapter 2, verse 5, my covenant was with him. Of life and peace. And I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. You're afraid to offend God. You honor God so much, you love God so much, you do not want to, you don't want to offend him. And it says, My covenant of life and my covenant of peace will be with such a man and such a woman, such a boy, such a girl. In verse 6, the law of truth was in his mouth. And iniquity was not found in his lips. Those are the people that have the covenant with the Lord. The covenant of life. When you have totally abandoned iniquity. 
You have turned away from iniquity. You have turned away from sin. And you have the Lord as your personal Savior. He walked with me in peace and equity. And did turn many away from iniquity. What is the passion of your soul? And the desire of your heart. To turn people away from their sin, from their iniquity. Then it says, for the priest lives, shall keep knowledge. And they shall seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But then you understand that after the water of life, which you have today, that's your salvation. And the fountain of life, which is the abundance provision of the Lord for those who depart from the paths of death. And then the covenant of life, telling the Lord, I know that you are alive. And I have your life in me and I'm never going to depart from that light. You take of the bread of life. The bread of life. You want to eat over there, the tree of life? Well, don't just wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to heaven, I'm going to eat the, bread, uh, the, the tree of life. You first of all take over here the bread of life. It tells us in John chapter 6. John chapter 6, I'm looking at verse 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. That is when you come to the Lord and you take of this bread of life. You will not be thirsty again or hungry again for the things of the world. For the pleasures of the world. For the dressing of the world. For the cosmetics of the world. And for the pollutions of the world. For the distractions which they call attractions of the world. Because it says you come. You believe in him and you take of the bread of life and then you'll never be hungry for the polluted husks of the world anymore. Neither are you thirsty for the things of the world anymore. Verse 48, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Jesus said, verse 50, this is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and never die that is not to die spiritually not only that there is a word of life the word of life when you come to the lord if it's your passion your desire that you want to get to heaven at last and be able to take of that tree of life then over here you want to have the word of life first first john chapter 1 verse 1 first john chapter 1 verse 1 that which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our eyes have handled of the word of life. You see, many people, when they read the book of Revelation, they even think about it. What of life? What of life? Tree of life, tree of life. They want to be there. We're going to the new Jerusalem, and we're going to eat of that tree, and we're going to drink of that water. But have you taken the water of life here? Have you visited the Lord? Have you prayed to the Lord? Do you have the fountain of life here? Do you depart from evil? Number three, do you have the covenant of life with the Lord here? Have you taken of that bread of life here? And have you taken of the word of life? The totality of the word? Are you receiving that word? That's what the angel told Peter in chapter 5 of Acts. Acts chapter 5, reading from verse 20. Acts chapter 5, verse 20. Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life all the words of life everything without reserving anything give them everything and you know what we also have what we, what is called the spirit of life and it is with the presence of that spirit of life in us see already we are part of that life that we're going to partake of when we get to heaven what of life already available here and the fountain of life already available here and the bread of life already available here and the covenant of life and the word of life and then the spirit of life living within us in romans chapter 8 verse 2 romans chapter 8 verse 2 for the law of the spirit of life in christ has made me free from the law of sin and death the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death now when you have that spirit of life in you already it makes you to be able to have 
actually the, the victory over sin and over death not only over sin but over sickness as well because we're told in verse 11 it says but if the spirit of him that raised up jesus from the dead dwell in you he that raised up christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by spirit that dwelleth in you the spirit of life dwelling within you making you free and then we're told in proverbs chapter 3 about the present tree of life in a spiritual sense which you can have now proverbs chapter 3 I'm reading from verse 13 all through to verse 18. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 13. Happy is a man that findeth wisdom, and a man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more that is wisdom, is more precious than rubies. And all things that thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her, unto wisdom, the wisdom of God. The length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honor, a ways, a ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is, that is wisdom, is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is everyone that retained her. When you come to the Lord today, you study the word of God, and that word of God gives you wisdom, and you retain that wisdom. The wisdom to live a righteous life. The wisdom to overcome every temptation. The wisdom to avoid every snare of the devil. Then, you have that tree of life here, and if you die in that condition, already having the wisdom of God, partaking of that tree of life here, then you'll get to heaven, and eventually you'll be among the people that will take of the tree of life in heaven. But again, to summarize that part for you. How do we know that? What's the evidence that you have the water of life right now? Salvation. That you are taking of the fountain of life now, of the pleasures of the Lord, satisfaction in the Lord. And that you have the covenant of life right here, and that you have the bread of life, taking it, and the word of life, and the spirit of life, and the wisdom of God, which is the tree of life now. Well, you summarize everything to mean that your name is in the book of life. Because if you, your name is not in the book of life, how are you going to take the water of life over there? If your name is not in the book of life, how are you going to be able to eat of the tree of life over there? We're looking at Revelation chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 5. Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. The people that will be able to take of that water of life and the tree of life, when we eventually get there, are the people that have their names in the book of life. They have not um, sinned against the Lord, and their names have not been rubbed up, wiped off from the book of life. Because we're told in Revelation chapter 21, verse 27, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever walketh abomination, or maketh a lie, manufactures a lie, produces a lie, lives a, a, a life of insincerity and lying. But they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. As we come to Revelation chapter 22, we're not looking at verses 5, 6, and 7. The return and the reign of the Lord. Revelation chapter 22 from verse 5. And there shall be no night there. And they need no candle, neither the light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These things are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophet sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sins of the prophecy of this book. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sins of the prophecy of this book. Uh, you, you see in verse 7 it says behold I come quickly that is the return of the Lord and then in the latter part of verse 5 and they shall reign forever and ever that is we shall reign with him 
That is the reign of the Lord. On the one hand, there is the return of the Lord. And then after that, there is the reign of the Lord. And you see what John said. He said, and he said unto me, these things are faithful and true. There is a confirmation from God. A confirmation from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The angel, uh, that uh, through the angel, that the visions revealed in this book of Revelation, they are all true and they are all faithful. All that has been made known through the symbols and through the visions and through direct language is true. Everything will be fulfilled in its appointed time. All are the things which must shortly be done. And you see what it says in verse 6, Revelation chapter 22, verse 6. And it said unto me, These are the faithful, these are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophet sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Must shortly be done. In Revelation chapter 1, looking at verse 1 as well as verse 3. It tells us, these are things that will shortly come to pass. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, during his earthly ministry, heaven and earth will pass away. But my word shall not pass away. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. The things which must shortly come to pass. Verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are reaching therein, for the time is at hand. That is, the time of their fulfillment is at hand. As we come back to Revelation chapter 22, looking at verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. And how many times do you see that in the book of Revelation? How the Lord revealed that many, many times. I'm coming. I'm coming. I come quickly. The return of the Lord. And look at Revelation chapter 3 verse 21. Or rather Revelation chapter, Revelation chapter 21 verse 5. Revelation chapter 21 verse 5. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write. For these words are true and faithful. All the words were studying in the book of Revelation. They are true and they are faithful. They are the faithful word and the true word of the Lord. As to the fact that he is coming. That has been revealed since chapter 1 of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. is return. is coming again. He had come the first time. And then his sacrifice will take away our sins. And he died and he was buried. And he rose again the third day. But then he went to heaven. And he gave the assurance that he is coming again. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. Behold, he cometh with the clouds. And every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him. And all the all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, Amen. And so there shouldn't be any mistake at all in your mind, any doubt in your mind that the Lord is coming. He is coming again. That's what he has said over and over. Chapter 3, verse 11. The return of the Lord. The second coming of the Lord. Revelation chapter 3, verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. I come quickly. I'm coming very, very soon. If it was very soon at that time, it's sooner even now. And it's, uh, it's going to be very, very soon that the Lord will come. Verse 11, behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast with thou hast, that no man take thy crown. He that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. You look at verse 11 again. Behold, I come quickly. 
Chapter 1, he comes with the clouds. Chapter 3, he comes quickly. He's coming very, very soon. In fact, it was at the time that Jesus went away from the disciples. That the angels appeared and showed them and announced to them and proclaimed to them that this same Jesus we have seen going up to heaven is coming again in like manner. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. Acts of the Apostles chapter 1, we're looking at verse 9. Acts chapter 1 verse 9 and when he had spoken these things while they beheld he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up behold two men stood by them in white apparel which also said ye men of Galilee why stand ye gazing up into heaven this same Jesus which is taken off from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Uh, when you think and when you talk about the coming of the Lord, there are some people that erroneously teach that actually when the Holy Ghost came on the day of Pentecost, that's what the Lord that came, that he has come, he has come again. There's no other second coming you are looking for. But the angel said, they same Jesus. And Jesus is different from the Holy Spirit. said, I am going to send the Holy Spirit unto you. It's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Holy Spirit will not come. And therefore we know that Jesus Christ is different from the Holy Spirit. And those who are saying that, well, when the Holy Spirit came, then it means that Jesus Christ had come. And you know there are some people, it's pathetic, it's misleading, it's deceptive uh, in another religion. Do you know they say that actually when the leader of their religion came, that's Jesus is coming again. Because you see Jesus, they counted him to be a prophet. And when they, this other prophet came, that's the promise of Jesus that he was coming again and he has come. There's nothing like that day, same Jesus. The same one that was born of Virgin Mary. And the one that lived a sinless life. And the one that died on the cross of Calvary. And the one that was buried three days and rose again. And the one that was going up at that time. The angel said, this same Jesus, which is taken off from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And so we understand and we know that the Lord is coming. He is coming again. I pray you'll be ready when he comes in Jesus' name. Let's come back to Revelation chapter 22. In Revelation chapter 22, we're looking at verse 5 now. And there shall be no night there. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. They shall reign forever and ever. Revelation chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 15. Revelation 11, verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. He returns to reign. When he came the first time, he came to die for our sins. When he came the first time, he came to live the life that children of God ought to live. He came to show us a perfect example, a pattern as to how we ought to live. And after that, he died for our salvation. And now you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and your sins are forgiven. You are born again. He gives you new life in Christ. And when he gives you that new life, you are walking in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then if you keep on walking like that righteously and in purity and in holiness and righteousness all the days of your life, if you die, then when he comes again, the dead shall rise and you will rise up. If you still remain alive while Jesus Christ is coming at the time of the rapture, we which are alive shall be caught up together with them and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Lord. And then at that time he comes to reign. He shall reign forever and ever. And then at that time we will reign with him. I said we will reign with him. We have been told in Daniel chapter 7. We have read this before. Let's read it again. Daniel chapter 7. Reading from verse 13. In Daniel chapter 7. Talking about the dominion of Christ. The dominion of the son of man. The dominion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
who will take over the kingdom and he will reign. Uh, Daniel chapter 7, reading from verse 13. And I saw in the night visions, behold, and behold, one like unto the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and nations and languages should serve him his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed that's talking about the lord jesus christ the son of man that is going to reign and it will reign forever and ever it tells us in verse 18 but the saints of the most high shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever even forever and ever as christ will be reigning then the saints those who have been purified and made holy and made saintly by the cleansing and washing of the water of the washing of water or by the word they too they will reign with the lord jesus christ verse 27 and the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominion shall serve and obey him but at this present time now that we are living on earth because the whole world has not believed on the lord jesus christ those of us who believe in the lord will suffer some persecution will suffer some trials in fact it is that that qualifies you to be able to reign with the lord because if we suffer with him and when endure that suffering and when endure the insult and when endure the opposition and when endure whatever the people of the world are doing against us because of our faith then we shall reign with him second timothy chapter 2 verse 12 second timothy chapter 2 verse 12 it tells us if we suffer we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Persecution will come. That's part of the Christian life. Difficulties will come. That's part of the Christian life. And the insults of the world will come. That's part of the Christian life. If you dodge it, if you run away from it, if you backslide because of the persecution, then you'll not be able to get to heaven. And you'll not take of the water of life. And you'll not have access to the tree of life. And you will not train with him. But if you endure till the very end, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 21. Revelation chapter 3 verse 21. We're told here, it says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and I'm set down with my father in his throne. It tells us the condition of reigning with him, and the condition of being on the throne with him, that we will overcome temptation, overcome Satan, overcome sin, overcome the flesh, overcome the world overcome all those negative suggestions that the devil is bringing in your heart if we overcome then he said we'll sit with him on his throne even as he has overcome and he said with his father seated with his father on the throne come back to revelation chapter 22 we're reading now from verse 5 and there shall be no night there and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the, for the Lord God giveth them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophet sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book the people that keep the sayings of the prophecy of this book the people that keep the people that obey the people that love the lord so much they don't they will never disobey the lord or disregard the commandments of the lord those are the people that will reign with the lord on the final day in revelation chapter 1 verse 7 verse 3 rather revelation chapter 1 verse 3 to keep the sins of the prophecy of this book revelation chapter 1 verse 3 blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep 
That's the secret and keep. That's the requirement and keep. That's the demand and keep and obey and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. In Luke chapter 11 verse 28, keeping the word of God. That's the secret. Keeping the word of God. Obeying the word of God. In Luke chapter 11 verse 28, let me read from verse 27. And it came to pass, as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bear thee, and the paths which thou hast sought. And then Jesus brought that woman uh, back to the normal theme. It's keeping the word of God that, that means blessing. But he said, Ye rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Not only to hear, not only to study, not only to read, not even only to preach it, but keep, to obey. Blessed rather are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Revelation chapter 22 verse 14. In Revelation chapter 22 verse 14, here we find the blessedness again. It belongs to the people that obey and the people that do. And the people that actually give their whole heart to the obedience of the word of God. Revelation chapter 22, reading verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. The people that do. The people that will be able to partake of the tree of life and the water of life and reign with the Lord. And there's something here I want to point to you. Look at Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. We're reading now from verse 3. And there shall be no more curse but the throne of, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servant shall serve him. And they shall see his face. Note that in your Bible. They shall see his face. Uh, isn't this, isn't that our desire? If you know about Fanny Crosby, she, she was a, a songwriter. And actually she was blind. But then her desire was that she will see the Lord eventually. And here's what she said. When my life walk is ended and I cross the swelling tide. When the bright and the glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side. And a smile will be the first to welcome me. And that's what, that's what he desired. Through the gates to the city in a robe of spotless white, he will lead me where no tears shall ever fall. In the glad song of the ages, I shall mingle with delight, but I long to meet my Savior first of all. First of all, I delight, I want to see my Savior, to see, to see, to see the Lord, to see the King, the great King in his beauty. Look at Isaiah chapter 33. Isaiah chapter 33. We're reading from verse 15. Isaiah 3, verse 15. The people that will see the Lord on the final day. He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly. He that despiseth the gain of oppressions. And that shaketh his hands from the holding of bribes. That stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood. And shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. He shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munition of the rocks. Bread shall be given him. His water shall not fail. Shall be sure. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. You see the qualification there? You are saved. You are sanctified. There's a change of life. There's transformation in your life. And then it says, you are not giving bribe, neither are you uh, taking it for anybody, neither are you uh, taking it for yourself. And then you stop your ears from hearing of blood and your eyes from seeing evil. Those are the people that will see the king in his beauty. And he shall behold the land that is far off. He shall behold the land that is far off. To see him means that you need to be pure. And you need to be purged. You need to be holy. First John chapter 3 verse 2. First John chapter 3 verse 2. Beloved, 
Now are we the sons of God. But, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when it shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him. See him. We shall see him as he is. Then in verse 3, every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Let's come back to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, reading now from verse 8. The reaction of John and the rebuke of love that the angel gave him. See the reaction here. Revelation chapter 22 verse 8. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard, when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then said he unto me, See thou do it not. For I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, of them and of them which keep the saints of the book, of this book. Worship God. Revelation chapter 19 verse 10. In Revelation chapter 19 verse 10, something similar to this had happened earlier. It says, And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou, do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have, that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. Actually, John the Beloved, when he heard those words and saw the visions, he was so overwhelmed by what he saw. And he was so conquered by what he heard. That he fell down to worship before the feet of the angel. Who had revealed all those great marvelous things to him. But he was promptly rebuked and corrected by the angel. He was not to worship an angel. And we are not to worship angel. Even though he had received extraordinary revelations through the angel. He was to worship God only. And so you find that angel rebuking him, correcting him, making him to get up. Don't worship me, he said. Look at that verse Verse 9, it says, Then said he unto me, See thou do it not, don't worship the angel. I am of thy, for I am thy fellow servant, and of, the, of thy brethren, and the pro, of the prophets, and of them that keep the saints of this book. Commandment number 2, worship God. Commandment number 1, do not worship an angel. Commandment number 2, worship God. Actually, as we look at the word of God, number 1, we are not to worship angels. Number two, we're not to worship any creature or created thing. Number three, we're not to worship the sun, the moon, the stars. Number four, we're not to worship images. Number five, we're not to worship Satan or demons. Number six, we're not to worship what the traditions of men. Number seven, we're to worship God only and worship God alone. One, we're not to worship angels. In Colossians chapter two, I'm reading from verse 18. Colossians chapter 2, verse 18. Let no man beguile you. Let no man deceive you. Let no man draw you away. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility. And the worshipping of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. And there are people that do that today. It's like they're not reading the Bible. Here we're told, do not allow anybody to draw you into error, to deceive you, to beguile you, and to lie to you in the thinking that you're going to have a reward by the voluntary humility of worshipping angels. Never do it. Don't do it. Because those who worship angels or the hosts of heaven are going to be punished. Sephaniah chapter 1. Sephaniah chapter 1. I'm reading verses 4 and 5. In Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, I will also stretch out my hand upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the name of Kemarims with the priests and them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops. I'll cut them off, I'll punish them. 
and then they will not have any part in the in the resurrection of the saints and the rapture of the saints and in the reward of the saints we are not to worship angels number two we are not to worship any creature or any created thing not to worship any creature or any created thing in romans chapter 1 verse 25 romans 1 verse 25 who change the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. God just gave them up because they worship the creature more than the creator. The Lord is warning us and the Lord is telling us we mustn't worship any creature or any created thing. When you bow down to something, is that something made by man? Even created by God, we're not to worship that. Number three, we're not to worship the sun because those who worship the sun or they worship the stars or they worship the moon, they'll suffer the punishment of the Lord. Number four, we shall not worship images. Exodus chapter 34. In Exodus chapter 34, we're looking at verse 14. Exodus chapter 34, reading from verse 14. For thou shalt worship no other God. For the Lord whose name is jealous, is a jealous God. We shouldn't worship any other God, any image. If you back up to verse 13, it says, But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, cut down their groves. Exodus chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 3. Exodus chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 3. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto 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 them unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments number one we're not to worship angels number two we're not to worship any creature number three we're not to worship the sun or the moon or the stars Number four, we're not to worship images either. Number, six, number five, we're not to worship Satan or demons. We're not to worship Satan or demons. In Luke chapter four, Luke chapter four, reading from verse six. In Luke chapter four, verse six, and the devil said unto him, all this power will I give thee and the glory of them for that is delivered unto me. And whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee hence, get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and in him only shalt thou serve. We are not to worship the devil or the demons. How about those who are worshipping Satan, those who are worshipping demons, those who are worshipping evil spirits? What will be their lot? In Revelation chapter 9, verses 20 and 21. Revelation chapter 9, verses 20 and 21. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils. There are those who worship devils. There are those who worship demons. There are those who worship Satan. There are those who worship evil spirits. And even when judgment had come, even the, if though the messages have come to them, they do not stop, they do not cease, they do not, uh, uh, they do not repent from worshiping devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their mothers and of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Revelation chapter 14 verse 9. And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast 
and his image and receive the mark, his mark in his forehead or in his hand. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the lamb and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast or his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name and then number six, we are not to worship God with the traditions of men. There are people that worship God. They say they are worshiping God, but they are following the traditions of men. We are told in Mark chapter 7 from verse 7. Mark chapter 7 verse 7. How be each, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Do you know that if you say you are worshipping God but you are holding on to false doctrine or the traditions of men, that worship is not acceptable to God? It says in vain are they worshipping me, teaching for doctrine the, uh, the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, they hold the tradition of men. They hold the tradition of men. In verse 9, And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandments of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. Who are we to worship? We are to worship God and God alone. Come back to Revelation chapter 22 verse 9. Revelation chapter 22 verse 9. And it says unto me, See thou do it not. Don't worship an angel. See thou do it not. For I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren, the pro of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. Worship God. We are to worship God only and worship God alone. In Matthew chapter 4 verse 10. Matthew chapter 4 verse 10. In Matthew chapter 4 verse 10, the Lord Jesus said, Then says Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only. Him only, him only shall thou serve. How do you worship that God? You worship him in spirit and in truth. You don't worship him with any carnal behavior, any carnal instrument, and any carnal attitude, any selfish attitude. You worship him in spirit and in truth. John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24 but the hour cometh and now is that when the true worshipers shall worship the father in spirit and in truth for the father seeketh such to worship him god is a spirit and they that worship him shall worship him in spirit and in truth they that worship him shall worship him in spirit and in truth psalm 29 in psalm 29 we're looking at verse 2 psalm 29 verse 2 here is how to worship god so that your worship be acceptable to the lord give unto the lord the glory due unto his name worship the lord in the beauty of holiness worship the lord in the beauty of holiness worship the lord in the beauty of holiness john the beloved has revealed to us today what the lord revealed to him and what has he revealed to us and he showed me a pure river of the water of life clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of god and of the lamb who are the people that will partake of that water of life the people that worship the lord in spirit and in truth and then it was two in the midst of the street of it and on another side of the river was there the tree of life which bear twelve manner of fruits and yielded half fruits every month and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations who are those people that are going to partake of the fruit of the tree of life they are the people that worship god in spirit and in truth carnality is gone Worldliness is gone. Evil is gone. Sin is gone. Self is gone. And you are worshipping the Lord with your spirit. And in holiness unto the Lord. In the beauty of holiness. Those are the people that will be a partaker of that. And there shall be no more curse. 
and but the throne of God, and of the land shall be in it, and his servant shall serve him. What well, the people that have, will have the privilege of serving the Lord when we get over there, those who serve the Lord here. And those who serve the Lord here, not in carnality, not in sin, not in evil, not in fleshly show or fleshly demonstration, but the people that serve the Lord here in holiness and the beauty of holiness, those are the people that will have the chance of serving him when we get over there and they shall see his face. Who are those people? Oh, the people that are holy. For the peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. The people that shall see the Lord, they that have this hope in him, will purify themselves, even as he is pure. Those who will see him, even as he is, those are the people that will see his face on that day, and his name shall be in their forehead, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither the light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Who are the people that will reign with the Lord. You understand now the people that have taken the water of life here. They have visited the fountain of the water of life here and they have the covenant of life here and their names are reaching the book of life and the spirit of life is living within them, giving them victory over sin for the spirit of life. The law of the spirit of life has totally conquered and set me free from the law of sin and death. And then he said unto me, these sayings are faithful and true. Who are the people that will partake of the benefit of these sayings that are faithful and true, those who are truthful here and those who are faithful here, those are the people that will be able to have it on that final day and the Lord God of the Holy Prophet sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. I believe you, you want to be blessed. I said you want to be blessed if you will keep the sayings of the word of the Lord. Don't worship angel. Don't worship any created thing. And don't worship the sun or the moon. And don't worship uh, any kind of a thing that is like an image, image of Peter, image of Mary, image of anyone, even image of Jesus. Don't bow down to any image. Don't worship with the traditions of men. Worship God and worship him in the beauty of holiness. I want you to rise up now and you will talk to the Lord. You'll say, I want to be a partaker of this. We're reading about the new Jerusalem. We're reading about the heavenly city. And we're reading about the city of God. We're reading about this holy mountain. We're reading about the people of God, the lamp, the lamp of God, and the, the, the bride of the lamb. And if you're going to be there, that means your sins have been taken away. That means you have given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. That means you are born again already. That means you are a child of God already. And that means that you have been washed with the blood of the lamb. And you have been drinking of the water of life and you are taking the bread of life and you are taking of the Lord Jesus Christ and he is your life. He says the word I speak unto you, their, their spirit and their life. You come to the Lord and say, Lord, here am I, I come to you. Here am I, I come to you. I yield myself to you. I surrender myself to you. If you are going to be a partaker on that day, you will be holy here. You would have been forgiven your sin and your sins should have been washed away and cleansed away by the blood of the Lamb. Are you saved? Are you a child of God? It's your name in the book of life. I about adultery. Is he gone? Fornication. Is he gone? Lying. Is he gone? Evil. Is he gone? Wickedness. Is he gone? Anger. Bitterness. Is he gone? And uh, all the stolen money. Have you made your restitution? Are you still worldly? Or have you been cleansed from all those pollutions, attractions, distractions, and all those ambitions of the world, and all the apparel, and all the evil things of the world, the dressing of the world? Have you gotten rid of them? Are you now worshipping the Lord in spirit and in truth have you yielded yourself completely to the Lord saying oh Lord I want to be a partaker on that final day on that final day you know the only thing that will matter is that you have given your life to the Lord is that you are living a glorious life a holy life and you are not living a wretched life a sinful life anymore yield yourself to the Lord yield yourself to the Lord there may be persecution there may be insult and there may be the opposition of wicked people of sinful people because they do not have 
appreciate your life of holiness that's part of that's part of the bargain if you suffer with the lord here in the persecution then you will reign with him on that final day why don't you come to the lord now and say lord i give myself to you i surrender myself to you this privilege of the righteous i don't want to miss it this privilege of being a child of god i don't want to miss it the inheritance of the saints i want to be a partaker and then when we get over there everything that adam and eve lost everything that they have missed in the garden of eden and they were shut out then they were shut out they couldn't take of the tree of life anymore and they couldn't take of the water of life anymore the river of life they missed everything but when paradise is restored when paradise is regained when paradise is revealed again we shall be there and then we shall take of that water of life if you take the water of life here today and you are saved and you are refreshed by that water of life if you take that bread of life here today and if you take of the fountain of life here today if you have a covenant of life with the lord here today then on that final day on that final day you'll be you'll be walking in heaven you'll be in paradise and the lord himself he will he will welcome you home he'll wipe all your tears away he will bless your life he will give you a reward there will be a crown on your head. And then you will walk with the saints of old. The people that have overcome. If you are an overcomer yourself. You overcome sin. Overcome the flesh. Overcome the world. Overcome all the temptations of the world. And you give yourself completely to the Lord. And say Lord. And you are worshipping the Lord. Single single minded. Single minded. And you are not, your mind is not here and there. And your life is not here and there. You are not falling and rising. But you are living a righteous life a holy life a beautiful life and you are worshiping the lord in the beauty of holiness that's when you'll be a partaker there and you are you receiving all the word of life here or are you receiving some and rejecting some or are you telling the lord the whole word the totality of the word the entire word the complete word oh lord keep on giving it to me feed me with this bread of life i'll never leave you i will never forsake you i'm going to stay with the lord and endure with the lord until the end until the end it's only those who endure till then those are the people that are going to be saved the people who get discouraged and fall back the people who get discouraged and backslide the people who get discouraged and they are not following the lord anymore they will not be able to partake of that final future water of life that final future tree of life but the people that continue the people that continue make sure you have the spirit of the lord in your life it's the spirit of the lord that will keep on guiding you and keep on controlling you and keep on helping you to be who you ought to be to live the life you ought to live is a spirit of life in Christ Jesus that sets you free from the law of sin and death you'll be totally free from sin you'll be free from self you'll be free from satanic influence and your life will be totally yielded unto the Lord make sure you're living that victorious life and the wisdom of God the wisdom of God the wisdom of God in your life that will help you to be who you ought to be and live the life you ought to live and be the kind of person that you ought to be in the wisdom of the Lord walk in the sense of Christ walking in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, you are not living in sin there's no secret sin there's no fleshly act there's no evil in your life you are living the life that glorifies the lord why don't you just surrender everything and to learn and say lord i'm waiting for the coming of the lord i'm waiting for the return of the lord and i want to reign with him there's a certainty the lord is coming again he said it over and over behold i come quickly behold i come quickly who knows when it's going to come in the morning in the afternoon in the evening or in the night when people are even asleep when he comes all of a sudden without any announcement will you be ready on that day will you be ready that night will you be ready when the lord will come you are not ready if you are not born again you are not ready if you are not saved you are not ready if you have not made your restitution you are not ready if you are not righteous you are not ready if you are not pure you are not ready if you are not holy you are not ready if you are not following peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the lord be ready because he says i'm coming be ready because he says
place, I come quickly. And blessed are those people that are keeping their garments and so lest they walk naked. Why don't you call upon the Lord and say, Lord, make me ready. Lord, make me ready. Lord, make me ready. Lord, make me ready. Any restitution to make, Lord, make me ready. Anything that you need to correct somewhere, Lord, make me ready. Do you have ought against any or somebody has ought against you? Have you settled with them? Lord, make me ready. Are you owing some debts and you are not even making any effort to pay them back? Lord, make me ready. Give me the grace that, Lord, I will be ready. Blessed are those that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter you through the gates into that city of God. Tell the Lord you want to be ready when he comes. You are doing the commandments of God. You are obeying the commandments of God and you are obeying it from the heart and you are saying, oh Lord, I want to see you on that final day. If you want to see him on that final day, no bribe taking, no bribe receiving, no, no bribe passing. You are not taking bribe to pass to another individual. You will you'll shake your hand away from holding a bribe. And then all the all the blood and the violence and everything, all those uh, evil drama that the people are, uh, the, the violent films, you'll not be watching them because you are shutting your eyes away from beholding blood. And you are shutting your ears from hearing anything that is defiling. If you want to be ready on that day, you are calling upon the Lord, oh Lord, make me ready. Oh Lord, make me ready. Oh Lord, make me ready. It's going to take washing in the blood of the Lamb. Cleansing in the blood of the Lamb. He wants you to be ready. That's why he came for you. That's why he died for you. That's why you are coming to church. That's why you are studying the Bible. If you study all the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you are not ready, of what use is that? If you study the Bible, every word of it, every verse of it, but then you are not born again, or you have not made your restitution, or you are not righteous, or you are not ready when the Lord shall come, or what use will that be? Call upon the Lord and say, Lord, I want to be ready. I want you to help me to be ready. Wash in the blood of the Lamb. Purge in my conscience. I mean a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. He can do it for you. He can do it for you. If you will call upon the Lord, if you call upon the Lord, you see Enoch, he walked with God. He walked with God. And two cannot walk together except, except they be agreed. And you agree with God when you are holy. You agree with God when you are righteous. You agree with God when you are living the life that he wants you to live. And you are telling the Lord, oh Lord, I want to be in agreement with you. Agreement in salvation. Agreement in sanctification. Agreement in holiness. Agreement in purity of life. Agreement in righteousness. Oh Lord, I want to be in total agreement with you. Agreement in one wife and one husband. One husband and one wife. Agreement that you are coming away from every sin of the world. Agreement with the Lord, with the word of the Lord, or the righteous word of the Lord, the unbreakable word of God and the unalterable word of God. You are standing upon that word saying, oh Lord, I want to be ready when the Lord will come. Make me ready, Lord. Make me ready, Lord. And then, you know, if you are going to be ready, you worship the Lord. You worship the Lord and worship him alone. And you worship him in the beauty of holiness. You worship him in humility. You worship him in obedience to his word. You worship him loving the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. You worship him without any sin. You worship him being innocent. Like Daniel, the Lord found me innocent before him. And before you, king, I've committed no evil. That's why the Lord sent his angel to preserve me. You worship the Lord in total innocence. And you have newness of life. And you're enduring whatever persecution coming your way. That's how to meet the Lord. That's how to prepare to, to meet the Lord when he comes. You deny yourself. You deny yourself. And you're saying, oh Lord, here am I. I surrender myself to you. I give myself to you. I yield myself completely unto you. That's how you are going to be ready for the coming of the Lord. And you're not worship angel. You're not worship angels. You're not worship any creature, any creator sin. Neither are you going to worship yourself. You'll not be worshiping your beauty. You'll not be worshiping your money. You'll not be worshiping your intelligence. You'll not be worshiping your position. You'll not be worshiping your ability. You'll not be worshiping your talent. You will not worship any creator sin. You'll not worship the sun or the moon or the stars. You'll not worship images. You'll not worship Satan. You'll not worship demons. You will not worship with the traditions of men. You'll worship God and God alone. God and God alone. In the beauty of holiness. That's how to be ready. You pray to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be ready when the Lord will come. 
you pray and the Lord will help you. Be cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. Be washed in the blood of the Lamb. And say, Lord, any defilement in my life, help me take it away. Help me wash it away. Any sincerity in my life, help me take it away. Help me wash it away. Is there any evil in my hand? Help me take it away. Help me wash it away. Is there anything that will not help me, that will not assist me, that will not qualify me to be ready? When the Lord will come, oh Lord, help me to take it away, to wash it away. If we walk in the light, I see us in the light, then we know that Jesus Christ with his blood cleanses us from all sin. Cleanses us from all sin. Cleanses us from the pollutions of the world. Tell the Lord he will do it for you. Tell the Lord he'll do it for you. Tell the Lord he'll do it for you. He'll cleanse you. He'll make you ready because that's the reason why he came. Husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. And he gave himself for the church that he might cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. And that he might purify to himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. That's what he came to do. He'll wash you. He will cleanse you. He will purge you. He will purify you. He will purify you as you believe on the Lord. Jesus Christ that he might sanctify. Purify the people with some blood. He went beyond, beyond the gate. Outside the gate. Let us follow after him. And be washed in his blood. And be purified in his blood. Yes he will do it if you will call upon the Lord. He will do it if you will call upon the Lord. Make sure you are sincere. Make sure you are sincere. Make sure you are sincere. You cannot get saved if you are not sincere. And you cannot be holy holy if you are not sincere you cannot be pure if you are not sincere and if you are still going back to that sin you will not be washed by the blood of the lamb if you still have a mind oh lord forgive me now and then you are not you are still going to go back into that sin there's no way you can be cleansed and purified and purged that way but he'll purge you when you make up your mind oh lord Never again, never again, never again. The pollutions of the world, the evil things in the world, never again, never again. I give myself to you. I yield myself to you. I surrender myself to you. Oh Lord, here am I. Wash my heart. Wash my spirit. Wash my soul. Wash my mind. Wash me internally. Wash me through and through. I want to be totally pure. I want to be totally clean. I want to be totally holy. Ready for the coming of the Lord. Make sure that you do that today. Make sure you offer yourself to the Lord today. Tell him to do it. Tell him to do it and give you the grace not to go and sin anymore. Tell him to give you the grace that you remain a righteous child of God. A holy child of God. A pure child of God. Irreproachable child of God. That the grace of God will be abundant in your life. He can do it for you. He can do it for you. Uh, salvation will not be a temporary sin. Cleansing will not be a temporary sin. And uh, the holiness will not be a temporary sin. He'll do it for you. When he cleanses and washes you and makes you clean and makes you pure. Then he makes you to remain pure until the coming of the Lord. And then for the rest of your life for the rest of your life you are not worshiping angels you are not worshiping men you are not worshiping yourself you are not worshiping money you are not worshiping idols you are not worshiping any creature you are not worshiping the sun or the moon or the stars you are not worshiping anything on earth or even anything in heaven you are worshiping only the lord alone worshiping him in spirit and in truth worshiping